Hello. Uh, I'm gonna do this talk that I that I did before at Ratnet last year. So I'm just gonna do this. <laughs> uh, the title is Distributed Secure Routing in Permissionless Flat Networks. It's a long title, so I'm gonna explain what that means. First, we're gonna talk about networks. Are you guys familiar with some of these logos? Scalobot, Aether, that, IPFS. And then all these things are built on top of IP infrastructure. They all expect that there's some way of moving IP packets around the network. And then as users, we usually understand these things. I know how to plug my computer into power and connect to the Wi-Fi, and somehow some magic happens, and then IP packets go around the internet, and then all these centralized or distributed protocols will just work, or not. So I want to talk about how these packets are being moved around. So this middle layer and like that dot, dot, dot underneath it is what I want to talk about. So usually networks are like in some form of hierarchy. Uh, you see like in each of these domains, there are like your local ISPs, and then they all operate something called BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. And then they talk to other BGP uh, operators. Uh, and then immediately there's like this levels of hierarchies that we don't really understand. It's very hard for us to imagine how we can individually move IP packets to my neighbor and our neighbor to build something that's a bit as big as the internet. So here's a quote from Axilia that I want to read. For a large network to scale, it must be subnetted into smaller, more easily manageable networks, which then must, be, must in turn be networked together to form a network of networks from inter-network connections, the internet. This requires some level of expertise and planning to do and tends to favor hierarchies wherein small networks are largely at the mercy of large networks. In, in ISP, uh, in the world that ISPs operate, there are like all these peering relationships that consumers don't really get access to because we don't have a big network and we don't participate in that relationship. We buy a contract and then they route IP packets for us. <clears throat> so that's how networks are and that's why I'm particularly interested in flat networks where this hierarchy doesn't exist. And now I want to better define what these words mean. Distributed, it means every node is capable of something called compact routing. Secure, end-to-end -end encryption, and the ability to route around malicious nodes in the network. Permissionless means IP addresses can be self-assigned, and this allows us to not have to call an ISP to get an IP address. It's an autonomous network. You can plug in, generate an IP address, and you are a participant of that network immediately. So it actually lowers the barrier to entry. Um, and flat random IP addresses means uh, we don't try to cheat by putting in, oh, like this subnet, they're together in this neighborhood. And that basically is like a way of encoding routing information into the name of a node. Um, and this allows us to have no, no subnet hierarchy. If we have subnet hierarchy, it usually requires centralized coordination. So what is compact routing? Compare, compare that to a BGP. Uh, it keeps small amounts of routing state at each router. In BGP, we keep huge routing tables that requires significant infrastructure. So rather than piling all that work into the core network infrastructure, the BGP operators, what we can do is have our phones and laptops keep a little bit of state. And the problem is now we don't see the entire network. So how do we figure out what's the shortest path to get to, from A to B? Well, we can give up on other requirements. Like we don't want the shortest path. We just want a path that we can predictably calculate the upper bound and generally perform well. Uh, and uh, require that as number of nodes grow, we do not grow with it. We grow sublinearly with respect to like X being like the number of nodes in the network. And I'm gonna add this additional requirement of name independence, meaning no subnet hierarchies. We're not gonna like start putting the entire path and state information to the name of the node. 
Um, so I want to talk about some of the protocols that currently implement this and talk about how this is possible. Uh, CJDNS is a auto-configuring overlay network uh, that in order to start the IPF uh, CJDNS node, you generate public and private keys and you hash your, your public key into a, uh, into a valid IPv6 address in this range. So how does that work? Uh, you perform uh, rounds of shards, and then you crop off uh, you crop off the end of the results, and then you get like uh, these valid CJDNS addresses. And someone asked before about hash collision. Uh, so this is not how many uh, how many addresses addresses are in the space, but what's the chance that two nodes end up generating the same IP address? And that's the birthday problem. And that's your chance of having the same address. So it's pretty low. Um, what this allows us to do is because we have this uh, cryptographic key generation in the, in the beginning, all the traffic at the IP level, not at the application level, can be end-to-end -end encrypted. And then uh, we can also self-assign IP addresses now, because like we generate the key, and then we derive the IP address. Uh, so we get an autonomous network uh, and with like these completely random IP addresses. Now the hard part, how do you get from A to B? So what is the DHT? This name gets thrown around a lot during this conference. Um, so the DHT, the official definition is like the thing that we blame when things don't work. <laughs> In every peer-to-peer -peer protocol, when things don't work, oh, it's the DHT, it's behind the net. What is the DHT? I'm gonna explain this. Uh, let, let's say you are, we're in a, in a space of like only four bits. We are here. This is our view of the entire network. There are only four bits. Um, we can map out every node, so all of these points are nodes. So to me, I look at like all these regions as neighborhoods. This is like my apartment. I know everyone in my apartment. Uh, this is my, my building. I know most people in my, in my building. And then like my city and then my country. And so, so, so like gradually you know less and less about how to actually get to uh, a person, depending on how far off they are. Um, so the way that you find path is by doing this. Um, I'm 0011, I wanna search for 1110. If you see a line that's, that goes like one, uh, I know how to get to this, so I'm gonna, uh, I don't know how to get to 1110. I'm going to ask you, do you know how to get there? OK, you don't, but you can bring me closer. So in this successive queries, I can eventually get to the node that I want, which is uh, 4, 1110. So after that, I'm going to calculate this distance. It's called the XOR distance. And then I'm going to store the path to reach 110, because I now gained this knowledge. So now I am responsible for keeping this information on the network. So this is how we kind of distribute knowledge in a in the Kademli tree. <clears throat> so in this in this way, we can have every node be capable of something like compact routing, not exactly, and then also have no subnet hierarchy. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. This is basically like encoding a path in a in a packet, like turn left, turn right. This is how you navigate through this. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I should just end my talk. I'm at nine minutes. <laughs> I'm going to skip to, if anyone wants to talk about Yggdrasil, we can talk about it later. And um, these are the channels for discussing these protocols. Uh, they're all on Matrix. And that's it. One question. <laughs> <laughs> so we have time for a couple of questions or one question. Um, in the routing algorithm that you uh, showed like a simplified example of, um, how does the node that's queried know what addresses to send back? Um, like, in, it, I'm just, I'm not 100% sure how the, the um, like in this example, how 0011 knows that uh, 
it should send back the path to 101, and if that's of interest to the original node. Right, so, so each path, uh, so you basically, you know the path to reach this. So you, it may go for like uh, these other people, and you, you end up reaching this, and then you ask like, do you know how to get to that? And they're like, yes, I know. So they'll give you a path to directly go there. Or they say, I don't know. And then they give you, but this is like the closest I can get you to. OK. But so, then there are also a lot of problems with like uh, these trees. They're like, peers are like friends. Uh, like sometimes they, they may not be available when you need them. Like <laughs> <laughs> or like they may lie to you. <laughs> So that's why sometimes these protocols don't work. It's like the, your friend might be just behind on that, and then they can't tell you the information immediately. Yeah. OK, so it sends back the uh, path to the node that is the closest to the node you're interested in, if it doesn't know how to get to that node itself. It depends on like, the way that the algorithm partitions information, because like, what does closest mean, right? Uh, it's not geographic proximity. It, it's not even like uh, speed. Uh, it, in this case, it's like XOR distance. Yeah, it gets you closest XOR distance to it. Let's give Ben uh, a hand, and we'll move on to our next talk.